I loved Final Fantasy. So much that I actually switched factions from Team Nintendo to Team PlayStation to follow the FF franchise in the late 90s. I had been a dedicated Nintendo fanboy since I first got into video games in the 80s. However, as I explained in my Final Fantasy video, FF7 was a PlayStation-only release. The defection of the franchise was most likely due to the size of the game, which couldn't fit on Nintendo's cartridge-style format. PlayStation was technically unlimited in terms of how big a game could be, since Sony could always just press another disc. FF7 was three discs, but some games like Riven were as many as five discs. Anyways, Final Fantasy VII wasn't the only game I played for the PS1. I got into Twisted Metal and Cool Borders 2, but one of the funnest PS1 games, possibly of all time, had horrible graphics and stiff controls. Oh, and was obscenely violent. I'm talking the original Grand Theft Auto. Grand Theft Auto was released for the Sony PlayStation and Microsoft Windows October 21st, 1997, developed by DMA Design, a Scottish game developer. DMA stood for Direct Memory Access, and was a term taken out of the Amiga programming manual. DMA had humble beginnings in 1987, with David Jones at the helm and a handful of programmer friends at his side. A game called Menace seems to be their first release that sold decent numbers at around 20,000 copies. Menace was a side-scrolling shooter and kind of got DMA on the board. But it wasn't until 1991 that Payday really came with the game Lemmings. If you haven't played Lemmings, it's a neat puzzle, get past the challenge with the reason sources given kind of game. It sold something like 15 million copies and was available on virtually every possible console or computer at the time. By 94, DMA was rubbing shoulders with Nintendo and released the super duper fun and creative racing game called Uniracers, also known as Unirally outside of North America. The game was a huge success. Aside from a lawsuit by Pixar, claiming the design for the unicycles in the game were lifted from Pixar's 1987 short Red's Dream. DMA signed on to develop a launch title for the Nintendo's Ultra 64 console, later renamed N64, which we all know it by. The game was called Body Harvest and was a third-person shooter intended to be released in 1996. Delay after delay due to Nintendo's issues with the content kind of killed the game as a launch title. Body Harvest was eventually released for the N64 in 1998, picked up by Midway and Gremlin Interactive. The gameplay of Body Harvest is a lot of running around, shooting stuff, and driving an array of vehicles. Sound kind of familiar? There is also an elaborate storyline involving aliens taking over planet Earth and eating people, but I won't get into detail about it right now. A game called Race and Chase started development during all the body harvest mumbo jumbo in April 95. The development team was made up of mostly inexperienced members who struggled to get something going until producer and creative director Gary Penn joined the party. Penn is a former game reviewer, alumni of Sensible Software, and winner of the Game Media Legend Award in 2007. Anything with legend in the title sounds impressive. Originally, a late 1996 release for Race and Chase was planned, but after many development issues, the game was actually released October 1997 and renamed Grand Theft Auto. I found a screenshot of Race and Chase online, which seems to be the only trace left of the actual game. Race and Chase had the option to play as a police officer or as a robber in the game either thwarting bank heists or attempting them. For reasons unknown, DMA eventually ditched the police angle idea and just went with Thug Life for the actual GTA release. GTA 5 has a callback to Race and Chase in the Casino Arcade. However, it doesn't look like the original Race and Chase and more of a ripoff of the OutRun Arcade game I played in the 80s. Nonetheless, GTA was a huge hit and DMA was bought out by Gremlin Interactive for 4.2 million pounds in 1997. Not even two years later, Infograms, a French game holding company with an HQ in Paris, 
bought Gremlin for 24 million pounds. GTA was published by BMG, who were bought out by Take-Two Interactive, which started a subsidiary called Rockstar Games and allowed DMA to continue developing GTA games. I won't have enough time in one video to cover the entire GTA saga, so for now, let's just focus where it all started for me and many others, Grand Theft Auto 1 for the Sony PlayStation. I remember a friend and myself renting GTA when that was still a thing, before I actually bought it. After about five minutes playing the game, it was obvious a three-day rental wouldn't cut it. Grand Theft Auto was kind of like what you always wished a video game was. A world where real-world rules and consequences don't actually exist, and one could literally run around stealing cars, running over cops and pedestrians, and crashing a bus at full speed into a building. I think now might be a good time to tackle the issue of violence in video games and the question, does it lead to violence in real life? Studies have found children react more strongly to violent video games as compared to non-violent video games, perhaps shouting or just being more fired up in general during and or after play. I feel personally there is very little connection to someone shooting a video game character and someone shooting an actual human. These are very different experiences from each other. Again, a video game is very much a consequence-free experience. When you shoot someone in real life, an entire galaxy of consequences open up before you. A million years ago, when I was a kid, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were on the chopping block as the reason for the downfall of society. I would be lying if I said my friends and I didn't try to act out the ninja moves the turtles did in the show on each other. However, none of us actually hit one another with a weapon or anything like that. It's fun to pretend, but when you whack your friend in the face, all of the sudden, it's not much fun anymore. Blaming video games for major problems in society is an easy way to turn attention away from some of the real problems, like poverty, inequality, the defunding of public schools, and defunding of social programs. I'm also not trying to say playing a violent video game helps anything. Another argument I am also not convinced about is violent video games help to get out your violent tendencies, similar to a rage room or something like that. When I'm angry, punching stuff has never helped me feel better. Taking a minute to calm down and try to rationalize stuff is usually the best thing I can do. Also, violent crimes have been on the decrease since the 90s, with no obvious correlation to violence in video games. I think if you are someone who is more sensitive to violence, then this is probably not the game for you. But if you don't really take things that seriously, then play on. GTA starts with the usual shout out to the game developer, publisher, and anyone else who put up money to make this thing happen. And then off to the start screen. There is an option screen with music and sound effect level adjustments, speech speed, which is how fast the text appears on the screen, and a music mode, either radio or constant. If you choose a new game, you gotta select one of the four characters available. As far as I've ever known, it doesn't matter who you pick. You still get the same crappy drawn character to play with in gameplay, and none of them have any special abilities or anything like that. The first city is Liberty City, which seems to be the GTA version of NYC. The game opens up with your character standing in front of a car on the city street. Text on the screen tells you to go answer the phones and to keep your eyes open for other opportunities. There is an arrow on the screen, which will be your best friend in the game, as the whole city looks kind of the same, and the locations of the objectives would be next to impossible to find without it. I gotta pause you for a sec and ask a question. I seem to remember in later levels of GTA, the arrow disappearing and the player being left on their own to wander around and try to locate the objective with nothing more than their cunning to guide them. However, when I played GTA this time and watched others on YouTube play to research this video, the arrow remained for the entire game. Does anyone else recall the arrow disappearing at some point in perhaps earlier versions of the game, or am I out to lunch? Anyways, there was also a map that actually came with the game, but due to its size and lack of detail, it is less than helpful at the best of times. The controls are a bit stiff and tough to get the hang of at the start. Basically, the X button is run, 
and left and right rotate the character. Circle is punch or shoot depending if you have a gun or not. Square is enter or exit a vehicle. Triangle is walk backwards. L1 and L2 are scroll through weapons, either a handgun, machine gun, rocket launcher, or flamethrower. R1 is slide over a car. This is very handy, especially when trying to get away from a cop or steal a cop car. R2 is burp or fart. Once in a vehicle, it's a lot of the same controls, but R1 is now the e-brake and R2 is now the horn. The arrow at the start of the game will lead you to ringing phones. Once you answer a phone, text appears on the screen, giving you the objective of the mission and the arrow changes direction. The mission could be anything from picking up a car to get resprayed, being someone's getaway car driver, knocking off someone who crossed the mob or is the mob, gangster kind of shit. Once you break 100,000 points, text on the screen tells you one of Don Sinetti's guys wants to talk to you and a red arrow appears. You can continue to rack up more points for bragging rights, but at this point you are able to advance to the next level. Talk to Don's buddy and a cutscene starts where he gives you a warning and offers to stick a gun where the sun don't shine if you cross him again. There are two more cities in the game, San Andreas and Vice City, which are plays on San Francisco, LA-ish area, and Miami, with two levels per city. If I gotta criticize, it gets a bit on the repetitive side, but definitely a challenge, even if just an endurance contest by the end of the game. There are a ton of cheats easily found online. Simply rename your character to one of the codes. Entering Hang the DJ gives you God Mode. However, you are still able to die, so perhaps a puny god at best. The shit turns on all cheats, including all weapons and level select, etc. However, you can still die again. Speed running the game doesn't seem super popular, but there are a few impressive times. The first level in Liberty City was beat in 1 minute 35 seconds by Tartan 3000 and has been held for over a year now in the any percentage category. Basically, Tartan piled a bunch of cars together and blew them all up at once, which put their score over the 100,000 required to finish the level. Maybe the most impressive, or least impressive when you actually watch it, is level two in San Andreas named Tequila Slammer. The record is 11 seconds, held now for seven years. As far as I can tell, it's just a dash to the exit point of the level after entering a code or something. GTA 6 teaser trailer was released earlier this year at the time I recorded this video, and it looks incredible, to the point where at moments I question if I'm looking at a video game or real life. I'm definitely more of a classic and retro gamer myself, but perhaps this is finally the point where I jump the fence and try a new game for a change. GTA has grown from a crappy 8-bit looking ridiculous concept almost 25 years ago into a juggernaut of the video game industry. Setting a new standard for open world games and allowing even a further escape into a consequence free world. What is the future of gaming? Did Spielberg get it right with Ready Player One? That we will all kind of jack into an open world as our avatars and just do whatever we want to do? Will we have a bodysuit that allows the body to feel the game as well as play it? Maybe that wouldn't be necessary if the game was attached directly to one's brain through some kind of an implant not unlike the Matrix? Or are we already there? And is our world just a video game reality? Curse Gazart does an amazing video on this concept, which maybe I'll get into in another video. For now, fire up the PS1 or emulator, let out a few burps and farts, and let's pretend we are hardcore thugs in NYC and not just a bunch of nerds on a couch.